there's a saying, you know, you can't lose if you don't give up. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's Eileen. So today we have a very inspiring guest on the podcast. So you know how Lavender is all about how to create your dream life? Well, this person definitely has a really good story on how he created his dream life and dream business. So this is basically an inspirational story of success, pretty much a rags to riches story, a journey of coming to America with nothing, spending a decade figuring things out, failing at multiple businesses and ventures to eventually building a multi-million dollar restaurant group with 11 restaurants, all different concepts and cuisines in California. So our guest today is Chef Viet Nguyen. Viet is the founder and co-CEO of Key Concepts, a thriving restaurant and management group that develops and manages proprietary brands and incubates emerging concepts. Since 2013, Key Concepts has introduced 11 restaurant concepts to the Orange County area in California. California. So we're going to learn about the why, how, and reason for being for Viet and his company today. You definitely don't want to miss this one. Hello, Viet. Welcome to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. I'm so excited to have you here today. Hi. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah. So you've done so many amazing things. I'm, I live in Orange County and I, I've seen your restaurants and I, I'm just really inspired by what you've been able to create. And so I want to get into your story. So like, I, take us from the beginning. Like, what is your background? I came here in 2002 first as an international student. Uh, oh. So at that time, I was just trying to get out of the country, try to learn more about, you know, um, I would say Western business life. Uh, at that time, uh, Vietnam was still a developing country. Everything was just still slow. Um, I didn't know what I want to do with my life. Um, I was going to just uh, apply to a bunch of different countries. And America just uh, happened to call me first. And so I passed the interview, um, and that's that's off I go. Um, so that's how I started. I started by just a, a curious child, right? Curious uh, student, I'm trying to learn more. And... Um, also learning about myself because I, I didn't know what I wanted to be yet. I knew that I wanted to do something big, but I don't know exactly what I wanted to do. How old were you at this point? 16. I was 16 when I, I uh, left Vietnam. Uh, and 15. you came here to study 15, 16. Yeah, yeah turning um, 16. Yeah. I, a lot of people can relate to not knowing what to do, what they want to do. So how were, did you always have an interest in food? Like how you know, guide me through that story of like how you started going into the food industry. Yeah. So, uh, from the, from the get go, um, I did not, uh, want to do restaurant immediately. Um, but I landed my first job in America as a, a busser at a restaurant. Um, uh, it was just the easiest job that I could get. Um, they paid okay. Um, at that time was, I believe $4, Twenty-five an hour or something like that, uh, which at that time for international student was not bad at all. Um, and so, going through a bunch of different restaurants, I moved from restaurant to restaurant. Um, I never thought I would actually want to do restaurant, just because the amount of work um, and you actually don't have a lot of profit. A restaurant's a very thin margin uh, business. Um, But I wanted to do art. So anything that Mm -hmm. relates to art, I was uh, getting myself into. Um, You know, I I wanted to do filmmaking. I wanted to do uh, music, um, even um, photography, stuff like that. But guess what? None of them work, right? So (laughs) every time that I fail at something, I always go back into a restaurant job. Um, So you were trying to do something creative. Some of the things, yes. Oh, I see. It's kind of like right. the story of a, a poor art student kind of thing. Like that's yeah. what you wanted to do your yeah. whole life. And you wanted to do things that you loved doing and it never worked out. And so the easiest job that you can fall back into is the restaurant industry because the restaurant industry, there's so many different angles to it. You can be a dishwasher, you'll be fine. You can be a buster, server, a back of house, front of house, and you can still make money. Yeah, how many years were you trying to do something artful and then you were working restaurants? From the first day. 
the first day I landed in America, yeah. I wanted to do something that relates to music, a film, Hollywood, something that relates to art yeah. of some sort. And so what led you to your first, what was your first business and how did you start it? Okay, so that's funny. At uh, 16, um, I would start doing restaurants um, day in, day out. And I wanted to uh, start almost like a forum at school, right? So where, you know, everyone would bring their art and then, you know, we would talk about it. Um, and I was just uh, selling drinks. Um, and, and that was going to be the simplest form that, you know, I get to talk to different art people and, um, you know, just selling drinks and mix a buck here and there. Um, obviously, no one showed up. I think there was like two. Um, so that didn't work. And then so as time goes along, I getting into um, uh, understanding a little bit more about what music takes and, you know, you uh, Little Saigon, right? So mm -hmm. Paris by Night was one of the largest platform of music productions. Um, so I actually met a friend and then we, you know, went back and forth and I was actually his driver, his assistant, um, and just dropping off him here and there and trying to get my feet wet into the industry. And that also didn't work. I think I made mm -hmm. it into like one episode <laughs> <laughs> and, and it, that didn't work either. And so every time that I fell at something that's relating to that, I went back to restaurant. Wow. And so like what happened after that? Like when did you decide like, oh, I want to open a restaurant? Like how did that happen? Yeah. So um, guiding through that. And then so that time was leading me through multiple projects. Um, I think my second business was um, wallet designing. So I was designing different uh, monograms on wallet, um, you know, chipping in money with a friend. And we would order stuff from Thailand, uh, Cambodia, Vietnam, uh, bring it over here and just sell on eBay. Um, also, that didn't work out. Um, and then so we, yeah, I uh, started a furniture uh a company it's like a small importing exporting uh furniture company also that didn't work out um so i got into waste management for a little bit and then uh, a few other things um like wow. point of sale system software developer wow you really uh, tried like a that. lot of different things a lot so of many different, different businesses yes but if you really look at it um it's all relating to my final goal of like i wanted to do something that's relating to art in general mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so one of the last uh, few jobs that right before I opened my first restaurant was uh, programming. So I actually studied a little bit about app developing, uh, programming, um, got together with a company that at that time was the first company to put a POS system onto the iPad. Um, and then so at that time, I was also like finding odd jobs in L.A. And um, that um, having knowing the POS system actually landed me a job with uh, Kitchen Nightmare. Uh, for Gordon Ramsay and then um, work on a, a couple of uh, house kitchen uh, stuff in the back end. And so he was opening his uh, first flagship restaurant in LA. It's called the Fat Cow for um, Gordon Ramsay. And at that time, Sir New Pity Group uh, got together and opened that restaurant. So and what so were you doing for that? Was it the software you said? The software at that time. Just okay, so, so POS like is point of sale for people who don't point know. Of sales. Yes, yeah. the point of sales uh, restaurant. But I was more on the UI UX. So um, uh -huh. I was focusing more on the design aspect of it um, and giving them feedback on like how to make it more intuitive and um, beautiful. Um, and so at that time, they asked me to go there to install the system to give them feedback. And so being there as an IT technician for the POS company, point of sale company, um, I slowly helped them out more on the restaurant side just because every time that I felt something, I went back to restaurant. And so they asked me to help them out, um, you know, on the floor here and there, um, doing some assistant work. And I got to learn from um, Jerry. Well, her name is Jerry. And um, she at that time was running about 12 to 14 different restaurants for rest uh, Gordon Ramsay and uh, Serendipity Group. So I got to learn a lot. And during that time, um, you know, I, I kept being more useful in the restaurant um, that I was running. And so they were trying to offer me a job, which I couldn't take because I was still an international student at that time. So I didn't really have like a, a green card to work anywhere. Um, 
so I was doing a lot of um, cooking for them. Um, wow. Staff meal and, and you, you know, were basically I, working for them, but without officially working for them, right? Essentially, yes, because I was wow. essentially working for the POS company. But they, and they made give you me cook. Like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, they, they gave me like sixty dollars a day or something yeah, like that. At that I time uh, was you know making staff meal here and there, helping them out uh-huh. with call outs and um, doing some uh, office assistant work. And that's when I started falling in love with this is what real restaurant is like. You know, this is how you run a real restaurant. Um, there's a lot more to it. And um, cooking became a passion at that time. So I went to um, Le Cordon Bleu to study culinary school um, just to learn more about, you know, cooking because I love eating. Um, and so for me, I think that was when I figured out my own art that wow. was cooking. Yeah. And at that time, when the Food Network was getting very popular and, you know, uh, you know, chef tables and all those shows would start popping up. And so I felt like, I don't think music is going to work for me. I don't think film is going to work for me. I don't think, um, you know, design is going to work for me. But I can cook. Um, maybe I should be a chef. Uh, maybe I can still, you know, do art through being a chef. And um, that's when I found my, you know, I would say, extreme love for cooking and uh, passion. That's beautiful. What a journey getting there. Now a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. With so many distractions around us, it's essential to take care of our minds. Our mental health shapes how we feel about ourselves and our lives. That's why I pay close attention to how I'm nurturing my mind so that I can feel clear and at peace, or at the very least, okay, regardless of what's happening on the outside. Some of my go-tos are meditation, journaling, exercise, and BetterHelp Online Therapy. Speaking with a therapist on BetterHelp has helped me better understand myself and my mind. What I like about therapy is having a therapist will help you tap into deeper emotions and fears, ones that you don't notice in your day-to-day. BetterHelp is online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. If you're interested in trying it out, our listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash T-L-L. That's betterhelp.com slash T-L-L. How old were you at the time where you were working with the Gordon Ramsay and his restaurant and, and starting to go to culinary school? At uh, 26 years old. Uh, so, you know, so that's marked the year that I've been in the U.S. for 10 years. Um, so at that time, I was, you know, trying to find myself and, you know, 26 years old, try to learn how to cook again, um, scrapping everything that I learned. So I, I actually study uh, finance, accounting and all that, but I never really finished so I dropped out and decided to go into culinary school. And wow. in 2013, I started pulling money for the for the first time um, mm-hmm. to open up something of my own. And in 2014, was that launched, after cooking school? Like after you graduated? Yeah, mm-hmm. culi- I see. We I didn't graduate anything to oh, be honest. Oh, okay. I, I didn't, okay. Yeah, I didn't graduate um, finance school or accounting. And I didn't even finish um, cooking school because I found out midway how expensive it got. Um, mm-hmm. It was like forty something thousand dollars a year, and uh, so after taking three classes, I'm like, I I can't afford this. Um, so I talked to one of my chef uh, instructor in my school, and I was like, Hey, you know what? I was I, w- I was actually one of the top three students, so it was kind of very easy for me to kind of approach him. Like, Hey, you know what? I don't think I can afford school, so I'm going to drop out. And so he was trying to talk me back into like, No, you can, you need to finish. Um, this is good. But then I told him, well, you have a small cafe. Why don't I just work there and learn from you instead? Mm. And, you know, I can make some, um, you know, living. And you have a full-time cook and you can teach me everything you know. Uh, It's called Hot Stuff Cafe at that time. That's right before the the year that I was working for Gordon Ramsay. And so I learned a lot. Wow. So you were learning a lot working under other chefs and with other restaurants. Wow. So what gave you the motivation and the confidence to start your own restaurant? Well, at that time, I thought opening a restaurant was extremely hard uh, because mm-hmm. I worked it for money, a family restaurant. Much. Exactly. Um, and I couldn't make it work with my family restaurant. My family, 
uh, my aunt uncle's side uh, had a, a small restaurant in a 626 area on Valley Boulevard. Um, it's called Flo Pastor. And I was helping that for a little bit and I knew how difficult it was and how the margin was super thin and we weren't making money. So to me, it was difficult. Um, mm-hmm. But learning through how they've been doing it uh, with the fat cow and learning, you know, different aspects of their businesses, I felt a little more confident because I, I thought to myself, if they could do it, I can do it. Um, and, you know, it seems like it's doable for me after working for them for a little bit. So they, they really gave me a lot of knowledge of how to start yeah. this business. That's amazing. So so your first restaurant, which, what was it? Tell us a little bit about that journey. Yeah, so it's, it's called Soup Noodle Bar <laughs> yes, um, in 2014. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, so 2014, um, at that time, I, I was just looking for a spot to be my first introduction to the world um, as a chef. And, you know, I had dreams of making fine dining and all that, but you know, working through the business plan, I, I knew that it were, it were not going to work because I didn't have a name yet. No one would know me. It's going to be very difficult for a fine dining restaurant. So I thought simple and look for a plaza that, you know, everyone can kind of come in, uh, more family style kind of eating and, um, you know, um, having working at a, a pho restaurant before or like multiple pho restaurant before, I knew that there's a small niche in the market where food restaurants tend to know about, you know, like bath service and not too clean and, um, you know, food is like low quality, um, except for a very few that's like um, institution. So I wanted to kind of break that mold. And so when I found the location in Bonaparte, I knew H Mart and 85 Degree Bakery was going to be there. Uh, I talked to myself, there's a perfect location and uh, let's maybe not overthink it and just open a fur restaurant in a slightly higher income area and, you know, give them really beautiful ambience, a good service, uh, high quality, and hopefully that they're going to purchase a bowl for, you know, $10, $12 instead of 6 7 at that time. Mm-hmm. And hopefully that would work. And uh, that's uh, how it happened. That's, that's Was it an work. immediate success? No. Like once you opened it, okay. How long did it take for you to figure out how to succeed with that restaurant? It took us about two years to even operational break even. I think we lost like a hundred fifty thousand dollars first two years or so. Um, when I, f- I mean, obviously, when you first open a restaurant, a food restaurant, you charge people ten dollars. You're gonna get backlash regardless of what you do. Doesn't matter, right? Um, and at that time, uh, I didn't have a lot of staff, um, didn't have a lot of budget. So it was taking a really long time for us to figure out what people wanted. Um, But I was very confident that there is a market that, you know, it's kind of like doing the same thing with, um, you know, cosmetic, right? You know, obviously exactly the same product, but you can still um, go into different segment of the market. Um, And I felt that segment of market needed something like us. Um, so it took us a year to really solidify that, yes, we are a little bit more expensive. But, well, first of all, there's a few other things that we launch, um, fries, unlimited noodles. I felt <laughs> noodle was something that we can get about unlimited. We shouldn't charge. And so for $10, yes. Um, so it's about 25% higher than most other places. We get unlimited noodles. Um, you get good music, uh, really good service beautiful ambience and f- a fun vibe. Um, you know, I was on the line cooking every day. So, you know, I would talk to people and um, ask for the feedback. And it was a really fun vibe. And so after a year, I think I, we start getting some, you know, um, followers. And by the second years, the mass market kind of slowly understood it and they start coming in. And yeah. uh, I think we broke the mold and really f- being... I would consider quote unquote success was the third year, end of the third year. That's when we start making some money. I think the margin was still like 2% net profit or something like that. Wow. That's amazing (laughs) that it takes so long to even break even, but from the outside, like, like I know it's a super hip place. Like no one made pho modern and hip and cool. 
So with Soup Noodle Bar, how did you have the money to even invest and to keep it going for those two years that it wasn't making money? Yeah, so at that time, um, there's a whole entire backstory for this. I don't think one podcast would be able to tell this whole entire story, but long story short, at that time, my family was going through a lot of hardship. Um, and that was one of the biggest reasons why I decided to drop out um, as well of school because um, we couldn't afford it. Um, so my parents at that time had, I believe, a house left. And I, I did ask them if they can just, you know, sell the house and give me, you know, whatever that they have left uh, to start this business. Um, and they actually did. Wow. Uh, I think they sold it and, and got $200,000 left. Um, so I borrowed that $200,000 from them. And then the rest I raised from aunt, uncle, friends, family, um, for the rest of the $250,000, something like that uh, during that time. Losing money was hard. So during the time that we were losing money, we actually, I, I personally took out a small loan um, and decided to uh, sell whatever I have left to kind of keep it going. I think we were trailing right around ten to twelve, twenty thousand dollars lost every month, wow. and um, so it's, it's getting really, really tough. But right at the last three months, um, I believe we almost hitting negative. For some weird reason, that quarter um, customers start showing up a lot. Uh, and so that helped us break even right at that time. And I think we came as close as, I believe, $12,000 in the bank. Um, that was that was the, the final um, draw of it. Um, but I don't know what happened during that final month. Sales just picked up. Wow. It's like right when you needed it. I mean, my question was, did, were you considering closing it down during those Multiple times? times. That- yeah. And I'm sure since you borrowed money from family or friends, like that must've been really hard. So how did you deal with that? I chose not to, um, because at that time, obviously if we going to keep calling and, and talking to them about it, um, they didn't get more and more anxious about it. So I chose to completely block them out because I felt very strongly that this will, this will work out. Um, you know, cause they, as an investor, they don't come to the restaurant every day, so they can't yeah. really see it. Yeah. For me, I felt it every day. I felt wow. more people were coming in. I felt like my regulars are coming back. I felt we were doing really well. Um, we just didn't, um, perform the way that they would expect. And so, yes, it was very difficult at times when I uh, had conversation with them or phone calls, um, the doubt, the you know, bombardment of questions. And I just decided to tune it out and give myself um, the last three months to really write it out. Uh, I did talk to a few business friends too about selling it, about giving up, um, you know, this restaurant. But, you know, that's about expert advice, right? Um, When you talk about somebody, most people are going to tell you to give up because from the outside looking in, it's it's just too too difficult. Like, how are you going to make it work? Um, but there's a couple of few that uh, did tell me that you have something special here, hang on to it. And, uh, and one other person that was uh, sticking with me through thick and thin would be my wife at that time. Oh, my girlfriend at that time, my wife now. But she was telling me that, you know, I saw the, the light at the end of the tunnel. Let's stick through this. I think we can make it through. Wow. That's beautiful because even though you felt it and you saw that it would work, not the people around you definitely (laughs) didn't. And that's not easy to deal with. Um, And you mentioned your girlfriend slash wife now. And tell me about that relationship because now you are co-CEOs, right? Yes. Of of your company. So how did it, how did that happen? So when I met her, we were actually friends on Facebook for a really long Mm -hmm. time. We never talked. Um, no, we would randomly coming in and liking our pictures here and there, but we never talked. Um, and then uh, during the time that I was um, opening a soup noodle bar, I think we chatted a little bit. Uh, she was just asking, oh, you know, I would like to uh, come support. Um, and so that's how the conversation started. Uh, it's very um, natural. And uh, she was actually graduating at that time um, and was working for Boeing and Airbus uh, parts. 
And knowing that she was, um, you know, managerial type and also you know, very bright, um, I was asking her, do you want to join this journey? You know, um, she <laughs> came and, um, you know, hung out with me quite a while. At that time, I was still very, um, quote unquote, poor. So we would not be able to hang out anywhere. So uh, we closed one night a week, which is on Tuesday. So she would come to uh, the restaurant on Tuesday and hang out with me. And I was just doing mm. prep and uh, oh. getting ready for the next day. And um, I also didn't have a room at that time yet. So I was either sleeping in my car or um, sometimes crash at her place. And um, uh, s- some nights I uh, literally sleep at a restaurant. So I, we do have an air bed. So I have an air bed that I pump every night and I, I will sleep in the back of the, uh, of the restaurant. That's a crazy story because your restaurant like looks all nice and modern and it's like, <laughs> oh, he's sleeping in here. <laughs> because I chose wow. not to spend so much money because think about this for a second. You know, the the rent for that space was $6,000. If I was renting an apartment at that time, it was cost me like a thousand something. A car would cost me like 500 bucks. You know, with $2,000, I would rather put that toward like rent stuff like that rather than um so she would come and hang out and she didn't judge me and or anything wow. you know uh, sometime we would like just crash on the on the on the air bed and um she would go to work and um she saw the struggle that i had and so she decided to give up her work her career and just come to help me out at that time to kind of get through it and we did um, so, so was she um, helping manage like what was her role when she started helping oh as a restaurant I was manager cooking in the kitchen yeah so mm-hmm. i was cooking in the kitchen i was doing both right restaurant yeah. manager and um cooking at the same time oh, that was yeah. getting too lot. difficult <laughs> yeah uh, so she became a manager and then i was still continuing to cook um so i was uh, still cooking every day and she was helping me run payroll and accounting and help me manage front of house staff and stuff like that and um now we're here um and yeah, I still so, remember. Oh, go ahead. No, I still remember at that time to um, seeing how she, you know, really stick through everything with me. Um, um, so I decided to propose, but I didn't have money at that time. So I remember that trip. Uh, so we, I, I took her out to eat and asked, um, you know, I don't have much, but I, I strongly believe that we're going to make it um, in the future. So give me five years, and I promise I won't get you a house. Um, but um, for now, uh, you know, I would, I, I, I want to, I want us to get married. So we went to Macy. So we ate. I still remember we ate at California uh, Pizza Kitchen, and um, in uh, Acadia, uh, and then we went over to Macy's and uh, we picked out a ring. Uh, I remember oh. twenty five dollars or something, uh, <laughs> and she, she still keep that ring until today. Oh. Oh my gosh, she she's a keeper. Like she was down from the beginning and she's helped like you guys were a real partnership this whole journey basically. Oh my gosh, that's inspiring. Okay, so lead us to the journey of like opening your other restaurants, right? So Soup Noodle Bar eventually became successful. What made you decide to expand and and eventually create K Concepts? Yeah, so um in my heart, I always wanted to contribute to uh, Vietnamese American in the U.S. So, Little Saigon at that time was still in my heart. You know, every time I come here, I still go to Little Saigon. I, I felt that you know this is my country now, and so this is my home. This is my real home, and I I have to do something here. I have to contribute to 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 this town. Um, so by the time that we knew that we were going to make out of soup alive, <laughs> um, yeah, I immediately at that time, uh, was talking to one of my partner, my other partner, uh, his name is Neo. Um, during my worst years of my life, um, you know, he was helping me quite a bit, uh, helping me with, um, you know, food here and there and always encouraging me. So we talked a little bit about, you know, our passion to make a little Saigon better. Um, so at that time we continuously looking for a second location for soup, but we couldn't find one. Um, and when we went back to Little Saigon, we found this little spot with a little patio outside and we fell in love with it. Me, Neo, and my other partner, which is Ivy, my wife at that time, um, 
and thought, you know what, maybe we can bring young, hip, new culture to Little Saigon and uh, decided to open Tango Taqueria, um, it's Asian taco uh, in that spot that is now Vox Kitchen. And oh, how it came to Vox Kitchen, it was yeah. because Tango didn't succeed. Because at that time, you know, everybody knew Andy, Andy Nguyen, right, from yeah. Astro's Ice Cream. Uh, yeah. We model ourselves after him. So I was really strongly believe that, yes, I can be the next Andy Nguyen, right? Um, and so I was doing, you know, fusion food and obviously didn't, didn't, didn't happen. You know, there's only one Andy Nguyen and he can pull it off, not me. Um, so three months in, we closed it down. Um, running out of money again, uh, <laughs> having hardship again. At that time, Soup and Bar was just barely break even. Um, and then uh, my wife got pregnant. And uh, that, was, that was so hard. Um, so I had to decide either I'm going to sell this restaurant and just stick with Soup and Bar and call it a day, or do I just keep on going and maybe close it down and turn it into something else? And we decided to close it down and and. Um, op- reopen it as a modern comfort food. Mm-hmm. Um, and the idea was very simple. I'm going to ask Neil, my partner, what he would love to eat. Um, I would cook that. I would ask my wife what she would love to eat, and I would cook that. And I would ask my friends and family what they would love to eat, and I would make that. Um, and put it into a menu, and whatever works, works, right? And then, um, you know, and I feel like... I was, you know, an international student coming here. Uh, you know, I'm not part of the Boat People program. I'm not this, the first generation that born in the U.S. I don't fit in, so I feel like I'm missing a voice. Mm-hmm. And so in Latin, uh, vox means voice. Um, so I felt like this is going to be my voice. Um, this is me trying again, redoing, uh, you know, reapproaching. And so we reopened it as a box kitchen. Um, and the kitchen was very simple. Whoever that comes in, whatever that they ask to eat, and if I have it in my fridge, I will make it. Um, so oh, there's really? people that, yeah. So people would ask me, hey, I think you need a salad. I'm like, but make it vegetarian because I, I don't want to eat uh, meat. And that's how the pear salad came to be. Um, um, or the, um, the Lomo Sotato, and hey, you know, like I really like the, the bottle luck at uh, Soup Noir. Can you make something here? And we decided to go all in with Peruvian uh, aspect of it. So Elote would be people asking for. Um, and then my wife loves clams. So the clam soup come on. Neo wants galbitang. So we put galbitang yeah, on. And so that is that's so how the menu came to be. Um, and so that's Vox. Um, that's how it came to be. And at that time, we felt invincible again. And so I was on my high horse and, you know, let's target my fine dining passion again. You know, let's do fine dining. So we pulled the money again. Um, and during the time off, you know, we opened the Soup and Bar in Cerritos um, uh, at that time, too. And so we opened Soup and Bar in Cerritos. We opening a jam dining at that time. We were trying to get to, um, um, you know, fine dining again. Um, and I was sudden. What happened? COVID hit. Yeah. And so, I mean, can you go back? What year did you open um, Vox Kitchen? Vox Kitchen was 2017. Okay. And then... Yes, yeah, so it was about then, three years after Soup. So three years after Soup and then yeah. 17, 18. So be, you just had three years of success, basically, before the pandemic hit. Well, the 2017 was the successful year. Oh, okay. 2014 to... Uh, 14, 15, and 16 was just us struggling through, like trying to find out the voice and, and even have any money. And 2017, we opened Boss Kitchen. That's when it really took off. Yeah. And so with all of that money coming in, and Soup was now at that time stable and doing well. Yeah. And soup so now just you opened. had money to, to now invest have the in money other restaurants. To invest, I fully invested into the next venture would be fine dining, which is jam dining. And hopefully that we yeah. were going to open in 2018, which we did. Um, and right when we about to open, uh, you know, 2018, um, it didn't happen because it got delayed in 2019 when we opened. Uh, that's when the whole entire uh, coronavirus just started to kind of popping up. And we weren't sure what was going to happen. Um, so at that time, I was kind of iffy about the whole uh, fire dining scene. And so one of the trips I went back to Vietnam, I saw Diali uh, Boba. 
uh, really fell in love with it and, you know, brought it over to the U.S. Um, so at that time, we, we were also investing into quick service restaurant, QSR, uh, hoping that, you know, we can kind of balance out the fine dining and a, and a quick service. And, um, you know, lo and behold, uh, 2019, at the end of that year was, um, you know, obviously COVID-19 was ev- everywhere in Asia. And by March of 2020, we got shut down. Mm-hmm. Right. So Jam was o- barely open for like four to five months. And we even student during our soft opening, we got shut down. Every single restaurant got shut down. And so um, I couldn't make it um, for Soup Cerritos. So we closed our Soup Cerritos at that time. Um, and uh, because Jam got shut down, we had to come up with another solution because no one's going to order, you know, fine dining to go. Um, so we then come up with an idea, Hey, what if we just open a coffee shop instead? Um, and just have people come in, just have some breakfast, get a cup of coffee and go keep it super simple. Uh, given that I'm from the North, uh, my family from the North. So we have this thing called egg coffee was doing really well in Vietnam. And so we brought it over and we call it, um, Nep cafe. Um, so that's how Nep cafe came to be. And so at that time, we didn't have a lot of money because we ran out of cash again because of COVID, the pandemic. And so we lay out a bunch of ta- chairs and tables uh, in the front. And people were just coming in in stroke because they couldn't travel back to Vietnam. They couldn't travel back to Asia. Uh-huh. Where else do they go to have this kind of same feeling? So uh, Nip Cafe was a, a, a smash hit. And that, that was time. during the pandemic because it was during outdoor dining. Pandemic. That's incredible because that it was a success. Yes, yeah. exactly. So, and so yeah, how did you survive the pandemic? Was that easy for you because of the success of Nep Cafe? No. So doing that, right, um, Nep Cafe didn't happen immediately. Nep Cafe happened about six months after the, the shutdown. So during that time of figuring things out, um, we actually thought we were going to get wiped out. Um, sales were incredibly low. No one was going out the house. Um, our staff started to getting sick a lot um, during that time. And you already know about COVID-19, yeah. one person getting sick, you got to close out a whole entire restaurant yep. and you have to, and all of that costs start to come in. And um, during that time, you know, I sat everyone down to the room and I asked them, it's all of the managers, by the way. And I, and I told them, I, I really don't have a good feeling about this. I think we might be able to, uh, we might uh, get wiped out. Um, People are getting sick. I, I really feel uncomfortable. Keep it open. Um, what do you think? Um, how do we do this? You know, um, I would suggest I was fighting to just close it all because I I was really scared that you know someone gonna get sick and God knows what happened. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, the, the restaurant was bleeding. You know, twenty thirty thousand a month each restaurant. And the managers actually fought back. They. Um, they strongly believe that we can make it through and they believe that I can figure it out and they want to keep it open. Um, and so I listened to them, uh, um, gave myself a few days of sleep, uh, thinking about it, strategizing. And uh, I made one of the biggest moves I think at that time was going out and I believe I raised about $5 million total Wow! and kept going. And mm-hmm. I thought, all right, you know what? This is going to be probably going to be the biggest battle of my life. And if I'm going to go down, go down in flame. <laughs> so uh, raised a lot of money. And we almost doubled the amount of staff that we have during the pandemic. Um, so because I thought to myself, if I'm going to make one bet, if the pandemic is being taken care of, we're going to come back strong. It's probably going to be a V-shaped bounce. So even if it's not going to be a V-shaped bounce, I'm, I'm gone. If um, I made the wrong move, I'm gone. If, you know, I hired too much staff, I'm gone. If I hired too little staff, I'm gone too. So I have to raise just enough money so I don't be too much in debt. I have to hire just the right amount of staff so that when the economy comes back up, I have just the right amount of staff to come back in and reopen immediately which a lot of restaurants did not do. They, they decided to let go or lay off or furlough, thinking that, you know, they have to wait until the economy comes back and then they're going to start hiring them back. But that was probably going to be the worst move because the moment that the economy comes back in, 
they don't come back into work immediately. So whoever that maintains your staff would yeah. still have staff to keep operating. Whoever that let go of staff would not have any more staff. Yeah, because they would need more time. That's so smart. Would, yeah. I mean, with, with all of that staff during the pandemic, obviously they weren't all working. So were they just on call? Like you just had them, but they <laughs> work very little. <laughs> Some work? work very little. Some have to cut a call out for COVID-19. Um, some are working overtime um, in the restaurant to doing takeout. We use some of the people, including me, uh, doing like free delivery for a um, bunch of people. Um, you know, at that time, I made another big move by raising money to open Dave's Hot Chicken at that time because Dave's Hot Chicken weren't in uh, OC yet. So I felt, you know, with that big boost of sales, I would be able to support about 60 to 70 of my staff. Um, that helped. Um, and, um, you know, reopen NAEP was also not a big boost in sales. So that kind of kept everybody in line. And I kept raising and raising and raising money to keep opening this new concept. And Kid Craft Ramen came out to be, you know, you eating ramen in the car. And at that time I was working on another concept, um, to, you know, um, uh, filling in all of the spots that start to open up because during the pandemic, uh, you know, 40% of businesses got wiped out, especially restaurants. And so all these beautiful sites um, start to pop up as being available again. So I kept raising money again, and I promised the investor that you have to make this bet that after the economy comes back in, we're going to own the best real estate in Little Saigon. And so we got the spot right now. Uh, it used to be Tip Top Sandwich, and right now we just opened would be E9. Uh, yeah, which is the, I went there uh, recently. Italian. It's oh, so chic. Yeah, yeah. beautiful. <laughs> yeah, so we did that. And um, we also um, took over the, the law office, like three units, um, to do a Kin Craft Ramen to, to find a home for it. And so now Kin Craft Ramen lived there. Um, we got a spot uh, for Roll Kitchen right now in our office. Um, from a friend because she couldn't survive the pandemic. So we took the spot over and turned that into roll, um, hand roll bar. Um, Essentially, I mean, it's crazy because a lot of restaurants were dying, but you were using that time to instead double down and you started like buying the real real estate that of of other restaurants that were closing. Exactly. So, um, so again, like I said, at that time I talked to my wife too, you know, that if I make this bet, and if we're going to go all in, if we lose, we lose everything. We lose all of the restaurant that we already own. We're probably going to lose the house. No more cars, nothing. Like we're literally going to start from zero, if not in debt. Um, if we do win, if we do win, we probably will be one of the largest conglomerate um, that self-made. Um, yeah, in, in OC, the area. Definitely. In the area. Um, and, you know, um, at that time, all the managers voted, yes, let's do it. Uh, my wife said, yes, let's do it. Uh, you know, we're going all in. And um, so that's what we did. Uh, we raised money. We kept hiring. We nonstop hiring. Even if we hire them and we have to burn through twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 cash every month per restaurant, we didn't care. We just, we just hoarding on people. Any, anybody that let go of staff, we would just hoarding them all in we like, <laughs> you, you start working with us now and we create so many different concepts so we can start tasking them and um uh thanks to the government to be completely honest with you thanks to the vaccine um you know everything just kind of came back up and at that time we had the strongest amount of staff i think we had 600 plus uh, staff right now at the moment wow so we doubled our size in in the pandemic year yeah i think that it really like made it, it transformed the business and made it like so much bigger because you doubled down. You took that risk. I mean, how could you, how were you so confident in doing something like that? I was not, like I said, I, I was fighting to close it all. Um, but the managers didn't let me, you know, and I think at that time their, their encouragement, right. They, they told me that, you know, I believe that you can figure this out. So we're going we're gonna to fight on, we're going to keep on going, we're going to follow you through the end of the earth, but you have to keep fighting, right? And then so, yeah. so listening to that, I was like, all right, well, I guess I can't back out now. Um, so I was scared. I was, I yeah, was very afraid. Um, you know, looking at everything else, I was very afraid. Wow. To be completely I, honest. 
that is is an amazing story. Now I kind of want to pivot to to ask you about your process in developing like a new restaurant and concept and the menu, right? So what would you say is the easiest part for you guys and what's the most difficult part? Yeah. So, um, if you, if you look at it, so, so for me, um, I look at each of the restaurant as a painting, right? And so you don't work on a painting forever. So you, you would start out with an idea. You would, you know, um, start with the outline and you go in with the, the colors. And when the, the picture is done, you, you would stamp your name and you move on to the next. Mm-hmm. And so for me, I, I think that the easiest thing for me, quote unquote easiest, uh, would be defining what I would like my customer or my my viewer uh, would look at this picture, right? Or like a customer would come in, like how do how do I present this as a finished product? And so for me, it's easy for me to envision that, you know, like at E92 when I walk into Tip Top Sandwich with you know, everything was ravaged at that time. I have to close my eyes and stand in the middle and, and envisioning the music, the service, the customer, how they're interacting with each other. And so I was just there kind of like soaking in for like 30 minutes and thinking how the final vibe that I'm going to deliver to you would be like. Mm-hmm. And so that's an easy part for me because I'm mm-hmm. a creative. Yeah, um, you're the visionary. Like you see yeah. the end result, right? So you're saying when you close your eyes, you know what it looks like and you have a, a kind of a yes. vision. Wow. Yes, yeah, kind of like a vision of what I would like to deliver to mm. our customer. So okay. the moment that you're walking through from the host to sitting you down, you see the tree, you see the lights and you order from the, the menu and you see the pizza oven and the, the bartender shaking and all of that stuff has actually been pre-engineered to make sure that you have the full experience so to me as a performance right as a play um so so for me it's easy for me to think of it that way and take that approach because that's the approach i yeah i always do that's why you have a big team um and my team obviously ivy my wife she's meticulous right she's on the numbers you know make sure that operations are in line and all that stuff and so for her it's easy for her on the operation front and the, the execution of, you know, from counting finance to making sure we're in budget and all that. To her, that's easy. But it's hard for her to envision things. Yeah. And so we used each other's strength. So that's where, um, you know, if you pinpoint it, what's hard and what's easy, we think everything is both hard and easy. Because it's hard for me, but it might be easy for my partner. And so we would divide up the tasks. Um, so we don't cross each other um, so, and they believe in me, right? So they believe in my vision and I believe in them, in their power of execution. And um, so once the vision's in, I noted now, I work on the, on the, um, the branding, the guidelines, the, uh, the logo, the feel, the color scheme. So you're um, the one leading the the branding and the feel and visuals. Yes, of everything? the art side of it. So that's <laughs> right? you. Wow, so, it it really is your painting. <laughs> yes, it is a painting, yeah. right? So I I literally sit down and I, I have sketches on my iPad for every single dish I'm bringing out to. I I, I literally drawing it out and envisioning wow. it. Um, and this is how that's my approach, right? And then it goes into execution. So once I'm done with my uh, my vision. The logos start to come in. The uh, feelings start to come in. That being passed on to um, operation to execute, and then I will take on to the next role, which is I'm no longer now the marketing director and the, the visionary. I now become a chef. So now that with that feelings and with the the, the operation that that Neo is going to run the front of the house, and um, my other partner would be Edward that'll be running the kitchen. What kind of feel do I want to feel in the kitchen? Do I want every time that they yell out, people have to say, yes, chef. Um, I think, okay, maybe that's what I want because maybe that's, you know, push it up a little bit. Um, I want an expo inside and outside so we can communicate and then he can see the floor. That sounds like a great idea, stuff like that. And then, so from there, then we're like, okay, based on that feelings, what kind of food do I want to do? And so we already knew that we want to do uh, uh, Italian food, but, what makes it special? So, and we've been to a few Japanese Italian restaurants. I feel like the Japanese route was the route that we wanted to go with. And so at that time, you know, I would bring in all of the ingredients from the Italian side, 
bring all the int- uh, ingredients from the Japanese side. And we're just literally playing puzzle, right? Mm. All right, we caught it with watermelon. What if honey would work? Oh, you know what? Mustard. Ooh, fennel works How many too. people are in that testing room as you're like testing flavors and stuff? We have a whole team now. So yeah. yeah, it used to be just me, right? And then later on, me and maybe another guy. But right now we have a team of six people to encourage, like working really hard on something. So we have a pastry team now. Um, you know, I have, like for me, um, all things vegetables. So I'm like focusing on vegetable. And then I have, we have a fish guy. We have a seafood guy. We have a meat guy. And so everyone would be like, you know, taking care of their own department and we bring our ideas together. And uh, so we go from there one by one. And, you know, we felt like that would fit with a theme of the restaurant. Yeah. You say that each restaurant has like its own feeling and its own processes. So does that mean all your different restaurants, like the kitchen is run a different way or or does everything run the same way, but you just add the, you know, the flavor, different flavors on top? Yes. So essentially every single restaurant should be, um, Ha, should should be having its own identity, right? So you wouldn't you wouldn't have uh, the the customer to really enjoy uh, Vox Kitchen to go to Enai a lot, and you wouldn't have the Enai clientele to go to Vox a lot. Uh, maybe some um, they can cry across use a little bit, but they have to kind of envision too. Um, so like for Vox, we envision a lot of different ethnicities because it's also have the Peruvian side to it. Um, we envision, you know, very fast paced and people are doing a lot of takeout. We also envision like family, you know, like maybe you want to introduce your, your parents to Peruvian food for the first time, but you can't take them to a Peruvian restaurant because it's so out there. But at Vox, you could because there's, you can also order a garlic noodle, right? So it's kind of, you know, keep it simple for them. Uh, soup would be different. Kin is more like an open vibe, almost cafeteria style, stuff like that. Every single wow. restaurant should have its own identity so that, mm-hmm. let's just say, if you're feeling like you, you're you dressing up tonight and you're going out with three girls and you want a cocktail, that has to fit your vibe, you know? Mm-hmm. And so that's that's one of the things that we're working with. Yeah, I think it's, like it's so interesting that you cater to different audiences per, like different audience and different cuisine per restaurant. Like that just sounds, it, it's so different. It sounds difficult. <laughs> It is, um, it is, but it's, it's, it's very difficult, but it's so fun because you get to, it's, it's kind of like asking, you know, Billie Eilish and, you know, create the next album to be exactly the same as the last album. It's not going to work. Right. Mm. Um, so every album is, 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 is a different field. It's a, a different, it's, it's a mark in history for them at that time in the physical and mental stage. And so if you're looking at all of our restaurants too, every single restaurant is reflecting of my own uh, mental health at that time. And people don't talk about this a lot for creative, right? Especially for creators. Everything that you put out is reflecting a moment in time. Yeah, it is. It's an expression of yourself at that time, how you're feeling. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's what art is. And if you ask me to create the same thing two years from now, I can't because at that time I'm probably more mature. (laughs) I might think of life differently. Yeah. My spending habit or my my hobby is different. I can't give you the same thing. Now, what I could do is I could package it, right? I can package E9 into a package. I can package soup into a package. And break it down into the science of it and how we can grow this and pass on to operation and the operation team. They don't need to think too much about the moment in time, the the art of it, right? They just need to execute and make money. And so that's why we have incredible, incredible operation team. And they yeah. can just take an idea, a vision, and as long as it works, they can package it and 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 hire people and, and multiply it. And, and that's why I think... Um, our group has very been very strong focus in operation because I can create, but then what, you know, after I'm done and I stamp my stamp, you know, it has to make, be making money. That's the other thing that was really amazing about K concepts is each restaurant is so successful. It seems like you guys have it down to the science. I'm like, they must have like a formula for succeeding because each one is always so good. So, so what, what's the secret behind creating that, I guess the guideline or the science behind a successful restaurant since each concept is new and different. 
you're not like doing the same thing. Yeah. I, I strongly believe that because I chose the right people. Um, so choosing Ivy to be our co-CEO was one of the best decisions. Um, Neo as a front of house partner was the best decision. Edward as a back of house uh, partner was very, um, you know, uh, good because they, they'd be able to execute it. So I don't just explain to them the vision. They understand it. Um, and they just take it and they really using exactly the same discipline. I would say you have to use the word discipline because they are very disciplined in how they do it. And they keep, um, you know, hammering it out. And, you know, like, you know, speaking back of like creating all of these um, kind of moment in time, you know, like even the word key concepts, what is key concept? Key concept was founded in 2018. Uh, at that time, we started out with Soup, right? And then Vox, obviously, we didn't have a name for the group yet. We, and we didn't think that we we're going to create a group. Like, who are we to think that we can do this, right? Um, but then at that time, I told you because, you know, my wife got pregnant and, um, you know, 2017. And um, when Kira was born, um, that's my daughter's name. And so Kira was her name. And we thought, if we're going to do all this, then we're going to become a group. I mean, all of this could be for her generation. And so we decided to keep it, the concepts for Kira, right? The con- oh. These concepts that we're creating is for Kira generation. Oh, that's beautiful. Uh, hence, key concepts. Oh, I And that's see. also the key of success, right? Um, mm-hmm. it's, the, it's a passion, the original intention of why you're doing things that you do. Uh, a lot of people mistaken doing business for making money. Money a result. If you open a business because you want to make money, um, you're never going to succeed because the moment you don't make money, you would drop out immediately because what is the reason behind your business? There's no other reason behind all this except for making money. So the moment you don't, you tend to drop out. But if you work because something else, like for us, because we work uh, to create a much better Little Saigon, uh, for you as a part of our key concept, um, you know, flaw lawyer, you would continuously having new things to go to uh, enrich your life, right? And, you know, also in our corporate office, you know, we start hiring a lot of women. Uh, essentially, we completely re- women uh, own and ran, you know, um, our corporate office is almost 75% women. And so empowering all of those messages are very important to us. And so even the months that we don't make any money, we ask ourselves, what have we accomplished in that month? And if we hire a lot of talent, and, you know, um, you know, our staff got paid better. And when we first implementing, you know, full health care with dental and vision and all that stuff, obviously our bottom line got hit. But we don't look at the bottom line got hit. We're like, oh, my God, we're freaking out. But at that time, we looked at it and like, oh, look, our bottom line got hit only 1%. But all of our staff now have full health care um, on the upside. So it's beautiful. And so that's what we wanted to do. Because we never set out to just make money. We set out to do, uh, we set out to create art. Like you don't hear, you know, art loving creators going out there and saying, you know, I created this album, I didn't make any money, so I'm going to stop. No. Yeah, yeah. You know, they're going to keep singing, they're going to keep playing um, because they love the art itself, not, not the money aspect of it. If they make money, right? You know, even I can swear to you, um, a lot of artists out there, even if they stop making money at one point, they're still going to sing. They're still going to do stand-up comedy just because they love the art. They love the game of it. Yeah, love that so much. That was beautiful. A beautiful point. It's like you're not doing it for the money, and that's why you're able to make it through so many difficult times. Yeah, because we never look at the bottom line. We do, but we don't. Uh, you know, the, as long as we can survive, and we still have food on the table, and staff have food on their table. If the investor is not happy with it, feel free to sell your restaurant. I don't. I, don't really, I frankly don't care. Um, yeah. you know, I'm here not to serve the investors. I'm here to serve my staff um, and, the, and the vision of it all. And uh, if the investors are on board, um, they can still stay on. If they're not, they can sell their share. Yeah, amazing. Okay, so I do want to talk a little bit about branding and marketing of your food because you guys do a great job at marketing and all of your dishes are perfect for social media. <laughs> I want to know what goes into that. Is it a lot of research? Like, I don't know. What do you, what do you do? We actually worked with a lot of different designers over the years. Um, 
And recently, we even worked with um, designers from out of the country in Vietnam. Um, but as far as the social media of it, the aspect of it, we actually partner with um, some of the amazing talent, I think. Um, I don't know if you heard of uh, or met Derek Choi. Derek Choi mm-hmm. is um, uh, one of our um, marketing geniuses, uh, per se. And then Julie, Julie Tai, um, she's also a, a fashion, I, you know, um, account, and she's really into art and um, how to take different directions and how would customer would look at things. And so we're employing all of these talents, and and they tell us what Gen Z and late millennials would love, and um, they give us like direction into what art direction we need to take. And I cannot wait for you to see her uh, latest project with us key, called Key Coffee House, which is almost like a, it's almost like you walk into like a Gucci store. It's, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's one of our passion projects uh, yeah. we're going to launch very soon. Wow. So your Very secret really is like finding the right talent right. for exactly. your team. And, and that's because, because you can't do everything as a person, but you can no. bring on the right people that that's yeah. hard in itself <laughs> to yes. find the right people. Yeah. And so you, the, the trick is not to find them, but you know, a lot of people come up to me and like, Oh, how do you find all these people? Yeah. Like, I didn't, I did not. Mm-hmm. Um, they found us. Mm-hmm. And so it's very important that you set out a goal and a vision that is very clear and has to be a razor focus and easy to understand, right? And then people look at it and like, oh, I get it. You know, if any one of a customer going to the restaurant know exactly what we're doing, right? And it's easy to understand and know that we want to make Little Saigon better and we keep pumping out these new concepts because we want to, you know, improve the whole entire community. And so these talents actually saw that. And, hey, I'm inspired by the group. Um, you know, I've just been to Enai the other day, and I want to join your team. Or I've just been to Jammer. It's amazing. I want to improve on that. And, hey, you know, while eating there, I found that, you know, your customer service can be improved. I see that, you know, your pastry can be improved. And, you know, I'm pretty good at that. But would you want me to try? And then they will come and they will ask us. And, like, why not? You know, if you have yeah. a talent, come on board. And um, so within the probation period, they're, they're just giving us feedback and we improve and if they work out and they become part of the family. And so they found us and they, I think the, the most important thing as a leader is you need to create a home, right? And I'm not saying that I'm a perfect leader. I'm a good leader, per se. You know, I have still have so many flaws. You know, um, I, I, I'm still, I have to kind of manage my anger a lot of time. Just because, you know, I'm so passionate about something and sometimes your passion comes out as being, you know, aggressive and, and brass and, and you know, angry. But, you know, like I'm just extremely passionate. Like I, I work seven days a week. You know, I, I, work, I, don't, I don't count hours. I, I work from the first moment I open my eyes to when I close my eyes, right? And so when I see people that put in not 100%, it's, it's, it's really hard for me to take, right? So, you know, I still need to improve as a leader. You know, I need to control myself. I need to do all this stuff. But um, as a leader, at least I'm trying every day to make it a better home for Mm -hmm. talent, right? As long as you have a a, a good home for talent and they can come in and they can subscribe to that. And I'm I'm calling a a, a subscribing method. Um, They subscribe to the idea and being a part of it. And so we let them fly autonomy. Um, in this whole house and um, you know they can you know do their own things and they can contribute to the whole entire ecosystem um, it's, it's all about a whole platform and I would think consider key concepts as a platform for culinary talent wow amazing that's that's a great perspective um, so what is next for you? I mean, you seem like you're so busy but do you what are your next goals long-term goals what's coming up? There's a lot, you know. Um, <laughs> I mean, things on my plate right now, I can't even count. Um, yeah. But what's next for a customer that they could see? Would I cannot wait until they can try our, um, you know, coffee, you know, our coffee bakery, which is Key Coffee House. You know, that's next immediately. 
Um, and, you know, I want people to know that we're expanding, but not too far. So right now, our razor focus has been in Little Saigon, but we're going to take the next step into expanding into Irvine. So we're going to do a mm. lot of things in Irvine. So I expect to see a lot of us in Irvine area, wow. um, you know, and right now, me, myself, personally, I'm working on 12 different brands. Besides all the brands like I really crazy. Oh I have gosh. 12 more on, you know, my path that, you know, I cannot wait to show you. Mean you mean restaurant concepts? Not just restaurant. So oh. again, like, again, like it's, we're key concept eventually become an ecosystem where art would live and food and beverage is just one type of art. And so we just recently, and you know, you hear here first, um, you know, we just took over a whole entire theater, 20,000 square feet mm. theater, um, you know, with 600 seat theater on one side and the other side would have like a 400 seat banquet so that we're going to be hosting a lot of different shows, um, Asian shows, uh, American shows, um, and, you know, even our own. So we're going to do a key concept talent shows and <laughs> uh, stuff like that. And then, um, you know, for the community, we also going to open it up for the community to use. Um, so let's just say you yourself, let's just say you want to have an offline meetup with fans. Let's just say uh, you would be able to come in and, you know, and, and book the whole entire venue. And you have a theater where you can listen to music and you can have a banquet hall that you can do a buffet, stuff like that. The cool, uh, incredible things. Uh, we're also going to be launching a YouTube channel, you know, doing all this, this crazy food shows that we talked about a few yeah. years to come. Yeah. Wow. Um, there's so much more that I want to ask you, but I want to be respectful of your time. Um, I mean, last last question I wish we talked a little bit more about this is also just your Vietnamese background because you you came here like as an international student. So you have a more unique background. Like it's different than people who were born here or, you, you know. So how does that like background and that culture, how is that infused into all of your businesses? Yeah, so uh, looking back at my Vietnamese root, uh, root uh, would be, um, you know, obviously the cuisine, right? The cuisine and the lifestyle. So once in a while, I do go back to Vietnam, specifically in Saigon, the South. And, you know, whenever I see things are so interesting, I'm like, I need to bring this to America, right? And so having that connection with their root is so important. Um, and my parents still live there. My whole entire family still live there. So I still come and visit here and there. And, you know, and it's really weird. Like, this is like a very excellent question that you asked because this, I just felt last time I went back. And so um, just about a month ago when I went back, um, Vietnam um, went into the uh, final championship of, uh, you know, soccer and they won, and I found myself being in tears, which is so weird because, first of all, I, I don't really watch soccer that much. But, and, like, I've been gone from Vietnam for so long, and then when I go back, I feel like I'm traveling to another country. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Like, it's, mm -hmm. it's like America yeah. feels more it's like new again. your country. Like. Yeah. And then when you go back, I'm like, okay, well, it feels like just another country, right? Mm -hmm. But I don't know why I found myself in tears mm -hmm. when they won. I'm like, this is so weird. And I couldn't control it, it's right? Like, tears is, yeah. Yeah. And then, like, I, I thought, I thought um, I left Vietnam, but I guess Vietnam never left me. Like, it's just still yeah. in here somewhere. Yeah, it's your right? home. It's in you. It's, yeah, it's in me, and it's, it's, it's beautiful. And, and so that same trip, when I land back in America, and this is so weird because it's happened at the same time, the same trip. Um, you know, like how you came back to America when you take the escalator down? There's mm -hmm. a giant flag <laughs> of American flag. Mm -hmm. And they say, welcome to America. And this, exactly the same thing happened. And I felt myself, I couldn't control my tears. And it's like, I don't know what happened to me at that moment, but I felt, it's, I, I haven't felt this happy for a really long time. I felt... I got connected back to that trip, but this is my country. Does that mm, make sense? Like, it's, yeah, yeah. Like, I feel very emotional coming back here and knowing that I'm contributing to this country in some way, shape, or form. But 
you know, like I'm making a mark here in America as a Vietnamese person. So I'm not Vietnamese American in a sense. Vietnamese in America is another sense, right? But yeah. Um, and But I'm you're definitely making a, a positive impact here. Yeah. Yeah. But thanks so much for that. But, That's um, beautiful. I I do love this country a lot. And your story is an example of that. Like it's, your story really is like an American dream story. You came here with nothing. You, you really built yourself from the ground up, and I think that's amazing. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, um, and again, like my story wouldn't happen anywhere else in the world. It's it's gonna be almost impossible in America. All you have to do is just work really hard and have a dream and keep going at it. Just don't give up. You know, there's a saying. You know. You can't lose if you don't give up. Mm -hmm. If yeah. you keep standing up, essentially, you didn't lose yet, <laughs> right? I mean, you know, yeah. again, like for me myself too, I closed seven businesses before I opened Soup Noodle Bar. You know, and most people would have quit <laughs> way in the beginning. Yeah. yeah, but you know, I didn't lose yet. You know, yeah, if I keep on you going, kept going. Was, yeah, if you keep mm -hmm. going, you, you you never lost. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Viet. Where can our listeners find you online? Oh, it's um, Instagram is where I'm like most active. I would say just because that's where I'm updating all the the new updates and the new things that we're working on, and it's Viet dot Key Concepts. Very simple. Or if you go to our website, it's uh, Key Concepts dot info, not dot com, but dot info. Yeah, and Key Concepts is spelled K E I. I thought it was K, -E K earlier, but it's it's key concepts. Because of uh, our daughter's name, Kira. Ah, uh, I see. K-E-I-R-A. Yeah. That's her name. Oh, oh name Kira. I see. I see. Kira. So we call it key, just so, you know, yeah. so subtle. But got it. Got it. Yeah. Amazing. Concepts well, for Kira. <laughs> <laughs> I hope she's doing well. And wow, this little girl has so much already. <laughs> It's beautiful. Well, she's uh, she's my boss for sure. I, and, and <laughs> How so old is she now? Fact, she's four, turning five. Oh, okay. As a matter of fact, right after the podcast, I'm gonna go pick her up because oh. you know, I think that's my favorite time of the, the day. Um, being a dad is to pick her up from school. That's um, so sweet. I would not miss that for anything. Yeah, like you have so many things on your plate, but yet you still like that's what you look forward to. Yeah, I block off my schedule from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. because I specifically want to pick her up and hopefully sometimes happy meal for her and stuff like that. Take her home. <laughs> That's sweet. Do you, do, does she eat at your restaurants really often? Like, is, does she like it? <laughs> the only thing she's going to eat is French fries. So it doesn't matter where she goes. <laughs> That's the only thing she's going to eat. That's funny. You know, French fries. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> awesome. But yeah, uh, lovely girl. Um, very smart, but. <laughs> bossy <laughs> that's funny all right well thank you so much via i really enjoyed this conversation you're such an inspiring person and i'm sure the listener will love this as well so thank you so much well thanks for your time thanks for inviting me into this podcast um yes thanks so much for inviting us Oh my gosh, guys, that was so good. I'm going to do a quick little wrap up for this podcast. I don't usually do wrap ups anymore, but there was additional points that I wanted to share with you guys. I was talking to Viet off re the record and he was telling me things and I was like, oh my God, why? I wish we talked about this on the podcast. So that's why I'm going to come on and give you a little bit more info. So the area that he, he talks about, Little Saigon, is like this pocket in Orange County with a lot of like Vietnamese Americans and actually like my family lives relatively close to that area. So growing up, I would go to that area to eat Vietnamese food. Um, but he made a point that because I was saying that he he modernizes things. His restaurants are really chic. They cater to a younger audience. And if you go to that area, it's a lot of like older, like bad service Asian run businesses. But he made a point that he is really mindful not to compete with these mom and pop restaurants that have been a part of the community for so long, even though they're old and bad service and the they're dirty. He recognizes as well that those places are special in their own way. They're essentially like ingrained. They're a part of the community and they're a piece of history. And I'm sure you guys have probably known a few restaurants like that in your area or in your life where it's 
existed there for so many years, maybe even generations. And it, that is beautiful. So I think it's cool that he consciously does not compete with those restaurants. He even said that he, he considers like, okay, if I open this search, this restaurant in this area, how will it affect the restaurants around me or the community around me? He doesn't want to take away from the community. And that is the reason why he does not do Vietnamese food, even though he's from Vietnam, is because he doesn't want to directly compete and take away from these mom and pop restaurants that have been in the area for so long. So I thought that was a beautiful point like so intentional. So I, I don't know. I thought that was a nice little touch that I wanted to jump on here and share with you today, but I hope you enjoyed this interview. Definitely check out Viet and Key Concepts. And also his wife is like co-CEO and their team is mostly women. I think that is so badass and it is inspiring to me. So I hope that today's podcast inspired you in some way that, you know, as long as you don't give up, you won't fail. <laughs> Just keep going. Keep trying. Believe in yourself. Have the confidence. Take those risks when you feel confident about them. And I don't know, just wishing you the best, sending you lots of love, and I'll talk to you next time. <laughs>